Shikanoko, unable to sleep, racked by pain and fever, walked day and night through the dark wood. His flesh alternately froze and burned. It did not seem to belong to him. He floated outside his body, watching it sweat and shiver, wondering why it still clung to life. Often he hallucinated. The dead seemed to walk alongside him, haranguing and accusing him. Once he heard the horses shrill neighing, and did not know whether to run to them or hide from them. His weapons and the bag holding the broken mask and Kiyoyori's sword grew heavier. One day he simply let his own sword and the bow and quiver fall to the ground. He could not imagine ever using them again. The following day he was tortured by the smell of death. I am rotting away, he thought. It is all over. He leaned against the smooth trunk of a young beech tree, and then half fell, half slid down it until he was sitting in the dried leaves at its foot. The forest, in high summer, reverberated around him with bird calls and insect cries. Once he had loved that sound, had known every bird. Now it was an unpleasant clamor that made his head ache. He had buried his head in his arms, but now a sudden strange sound, a kind of rough bark, made him look up. A crafted animal, a sort of wolf, stood before him. He saw the flash of its lapis blue eyes and the dull gleam of its cinnabar lips. The clarity of the hallucination and his fever filled him with despair. Then the false wolf spoke in a thick, halting voice. Welcome home, it said, and Shika knew where he was and where the stench of rot and decay came from. It was over a year since he had ridden away with Akuzinji, the king of the mountain, but now he had come back, to the mountain sorcerer, Shisoku. It watched him struggle to his feet and then turned and padded swiftly away. He followed it across the stream, past the carvings, the drying skins, the piles of bones, the live and dead animals, to the hut beneath the Paulonia tree. It stopped in front of the door. Maher, it called. The vowels in its speech were clear, but it had trouble with some consonants. Master! Shisoku came out of the hut, shading his eyes with one hand. Shikanoko, why have you come back? What have you done? Shika dropped the bag as Shisoku approached him. It lay on the ground like a dead bird, the hilt of the sword protruding from it. What is this? Whose sword was this? Nothing should be put in the same bag as the mask. Where is the mask? It is broken, Chika heard himself say. Ah! Shisoku screamed like the mother of a dead child. It cannot be broken. No human power can hurt it. How did it happen? He drew the two pieces out and wept over them. Chika tried to explain. It was the horses. They attacked me. Not their fault. My fault. Shisoku's face was distorted by rage and grief. Without saying another word, he rushed back into the hut. Shika sank to the ground. His teeth clashed against each other as the fever sent violent shudders through him. Are you sick? The false wolf said. Master, he's sick. Let him die. Shisoku called from inside. He destroyed my gift, my creation. All the power of the forest could have been his, and he threw it away. The false wolf called again. Matter, help him. And it began to lick Shika's face with a tongue that felt human. The sorcerer appeared again. How extraordinary, Shika heard him say. The creature feels sorry for him. Maybe I should too. Yes, I suppose I must. He knelt next to Shika and felt his forehead, then, none too gently, examined the broken arm. While Shika wept tears of pain, Shisoku disappeared and then, after what seemed like an eternity, was again kneeling beside him, making him drink some potion. 
It dulled his senses enough for Shisoku to be able to align the ends of the broken bone. He longed for sleep, for oblivion. But every time he closed his eyes, he believed he was dead and in hell, burning in fire, pierced by swords, knives, arrows, and thorns, tormented by visions of demons and unquenchable thirst. He saw, over and over again, the horse's huge teeth as they tore into him, and his body arched and twisted as he felt again the hammer-like blows of their hooves. Liquid poured from his body, both sweat and tears, the waters of remorse. At one stage he dreamed Lady Tora came to him. Are you alive or dead? He tried to ask her, but she laid her cool fingers against his burning lips and silenced not only speech, but thought, too. Then finally he slept, maybe for days. All that time the false wolf did not leave his side. When he woke, he was inside the hut. He heard Shisoku say, It has become attached to him. It's the first time something like that has happened. I did not expect it. Even I have never inspired affection in my creatures. You are a greater sorcerer than you think, a woman replied. Shika turned his head slightly and saw it was indeed Lady Tora. She went on. Perhaps it is because you bestowed the power of speech on it. How did you achieve that? Shisoku laughed. <laughs> I gave it the tongue I cut from a human head, and I built speaking cords from gossamer and sinews. And the head? Whose was that? There have been plenty of dead between Miyako and Minatogura in the last year. This was a Kakizuki warrior who fled into the forest and died of his wounds. I came upon him while he was still fresh enough to use. That's his skull on the wall. Shika could see the new white skull grinning vacantly. Next to him, the false wolf whined. Shika Noko is awake, Lady Tora said. They both looked in his direction. Their shapes were outlined against the flames of the fire and the candles around the altar. He saw the huge swell of Tora's belly and remembered what she had told him, that she would give Kiyoyori more sons. Whoever's child it was, it was very close to birth. Shisoku was extremely angry with you, Lady Tora said, but he has forgiven you now. I have? The hermit queried. Either you have, or you soon will. But Shikanoko should tell us what happened. See if you can get up, she said to him. He struggled to his feet and, leaning on Shisoku and Lady Tora, went outside. They led him to the paulonia tree, and sitting between them in its shade, he related everything, from the blinding of Seshin to their flight into the dark wood, their capture by his uncle Sademasa, who handed them over to the monk Gesho, the knowledge Seshin had passed over to him, the winter spent at Ryosonji with the prince abbot. There was an uprising, he said. Well, it was started by the prince abbot, who dispatched his men to arrest the crown prince, but afterward it was said that Momozono rebelled against his father. He died, but his son escaped. I was sent to find him and bring his head back to the capital. I caught up with him in Akihime, the autumn princess, on the way to Rinrakuji. Ah, Lady Tora said, now I begin to understand. I killed two men who were about to violate her and the young emperor, for he truly is the emperor, you know. Everything recognizes him. I had two werehawks with me, and they knew him at once. I called them Korn and Zen. Zen tried to fly back to Ryosonji, and Korn killed him. We rode on toward Rinrakuji, but we were stopped at a crossroads by a spirit. It was Lord Kiyoyori. So he is dead? Tora said in a small voice. I called him back, Shika said, remembering the immense power that he had drawn on, a power that had led him into pride and arrogance and betrayed him. His spirit entered the unborn foal within the body of my mare, Risu. He drove the horses to attack you? Lady Tora said. Yes, and that is how the mask was broken. 
He fell silent, and then said, The sword is Kyoyori's. It is beyond repair, too. Nothing is beyond repair for Shisoku, Tora said. Even if the results are sometimes unexpected, like this false wolf that has attached itself to you. It must recognize my falseness, Shikanoko thought. We are two of a kind. But his confession was not finished yet. We went to Akuzenji's old hut. I was planning to bring them here to hide them. The last place you would expect to find the Emperor of the Eight Islands, Shisoku muttered. Shika went on steadily. But being in the hut, alone with the Autumn Princess, who I thought was the one meant for me, I put on the mask and found myself under the Prince Abbot's sway. I blame only myself. I thought I was all-powerful. Aha, Shisoku said. He could teach you many things, but he could not teach you brokenness. Shika wished he would stop interrupting. Every time he had to start again, it was harder. The Prince Abbot told me to do what I liked with her. I did, but she was to become a shrine maiden. She fled during the night. In the morning, he told me to kill Yoshimori, and I was on the point of doing it when the werehawk and the horses attacked me. When I came to, I was alone, and the mask was broken. The gods must have been enraged against you both, Tora said. After a few moments, Shika said, The werehawk, Korn, was turning gold. I remember seeing the sun on its plumage. It must be transforming into a hool, Shisoku said. It is the sacred bird that appears in the land when the ruler is just and blessed by heaven. That must be Yoshimori. I have to find him and restore him to the throne. This is a concern of warriors and noblemen, Shisoku said. Leave them to it and become a mountain sorcerer, like me. I was a warrior first, long before I became a sorcerer, Shika replied. Restore the mask for me and the sword, and when they are ready, I will begin my search for Yoshimori. Nothing will change until your power matches the Prince Abbot's. Lady Tora said. You are going to have to confront him and overcome him physically and spiritually. At the moment you can do neither. You have no men, no followers, not even a horse. In your first challenge to him, you failed. He forced you to make a terrible mistake, from which you may never recover. The horses and the werehawk, which should have been your allies, turned against you. You have a lot to undo, and even more to learn. How long will it take you to repair the mask and the sword? Chika asked Shisoku. When you are ready, they will be ready, the old man replied grudgingly. Will it be days or weeks? More likely years, said the sorcerer. I can't wait that long, Chika cried, his impatience signaling he was recovering. Lady Tora said, There will be plenty to occupy you. As well as all you have to learn, you have to bring up my sons. That will teach you something, Shisoku murmured. <laughs>